um, thank you so much uh, for that very kind introduction. And thank you also very much for your kind uh, invitation to give this uh, talk. Uh, this, I'm going to spend the next hour uh, telling the story of the history of collecting and exhibiting Chinese art by American art museums. Uh, this is a very big story and it's, it's actually much bigger than I can possibly uh, discuss or do justice to uh, this evening. So I'm really going to collapse this story into a few highlights. Uh, but I hope it will give you an impression of um, the, the, not only the richness of Chinese art collections in art museums in the United States, uh, but also a sense of the scholarship that has about China, Chinese art and Chinese culture, uh, scholarship that has a long history in the United States. And I will be speaking a little bit uh, to the, um, the circumstances of of that history of collecting and of, of scholarship. <clears throat> I'd like to begin with just a few lists of art museums in the United States that are uh, well known and famous for their collections of Chinese art. And uh, there are many museums that, that have Chinese art collections in the United States. I'm going to be focusing primarily on these six museums because uh, these museums are the largest museum collections of Chinese art uh, in the United States. And I will go through them one by one and just give a brief introduction to their collections and to some of the staff uh, who helped build these collections. Uh, the first, and I have them here in the order of their founding. Uh, by the date that, uh, at, on which they open to the public. So the first is the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which opened to the public in 1872. The second, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts, opened in 1876. The Cleveland Museum of Art in Ohio opened in 1916. The Freer Gallery of Art, uh, which is part of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, which is a federal, federally owned museum, so a, a US taxpayer supported museum. The Freer Gallery uh, opened in 1923. And then in 1987, the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery was built next door. So they are one institution now. Uh, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, Missouri, opened to the public in 1933, and the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco opened to the public in 1966. I have isolated these as um, the first six museums I'd like to talk about because their collections of Chinese art are very strong, strong enough really to be able to tell almost the entire history of Chinese art history just with their collections. And that's rare uh, for any, any art museum in the, in the United States. This, the second list consists of uh, a larger group of museums that have very good collections of Chinese art, but not necessarily uh, comprehensive. Uh, they are, and I will speak about some of them, not all of them, uh, that would take many hours. Uh, but uh, again, here in the order, chronological order of their opening to the public, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois, the St. Louis Art Museum in St. Louis, Missouri, the Cincinnati Art Museum in Cincinnati, Ohio, the Portland Art Museum in Portland, Oregon. These all opened in the late 19th century. So they opened um, while the Qing Dynasty was still uh, in force. Uh, the Los Angeles County Museum of History, Science and Art opened in 1910 and LACMA, the museum where I work, the Los Angeles County Museum uh, of Art became an independent art museum in 1965, but uh, was originally part of a museum of history, science and art. The Honolulu Museum of Art, formerly the Honolulu Academy of Arts opened in 1927. The Seattle Art Museum in Seattle, Washington in 1933. The Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, Maryland, just north of Washington DC opened in 1934. And the Peabody Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, uh, which opened in 1992, but was uh, originally built on older collections, uh, the old of, oldest of which goes back to 1799. 
uh, the East India Marine Society uh, in Massachusetts. And finally, I don't want to uh, finish this, uh, this talk without mentioning some very important university art museums um, that have very strong collections of Chinese art. Uh, these include the Yale University Art Gallery, which opened in 1832, the University of Michigan Museum of Art in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that opened in 1856, the Berkeley Museum of Art uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, which opened in 1881, the Princeton University Art Museum in Princeton, New Jersey, which opened in 1882, and the Harvard University Art Museums, uh, originally the Fogg Museum, which opened in 1895. All of these university museums originally opened to the public in the 19th century. I also uh, just want to mention, because um, I want to mention a number of exhibitions in the course of, of my talk. Um, and one of them is the uh, 1961 exhibition, Chinese Art Treasures, which was held and organized by the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Uh, this was actually an exhibition from the Palace Museum in Taipei. Um, the uh, Taipei Gugong Boyuan, uh, which as I'm sure many of you know, the collection there originally was the collection, part of the collection in the Forbidden City in Beijing and was taken to Taipei, Taiwan in, uh, in 1949. Uh, but it was uh, an exhibition organized in the early 1960s during the presidency of John F. Kennedy when the United States did not have diplomatic relations with mainland China, but did with Ta Taiwan. And this was a very important exhibition of highlights of the former imperial collections of the Qing dynasty and many earlier uh, Chinese dynastic collections. And I mentioned this exhibition in 1961, which traveled to several cities in the United States because it had an important role as a catalyst, as a stimulus for many uh, young scholars in the United States uh, the, to, to begin studying Chinese art history uh, very seriously. This also happened in the, uh, the, the decades just, bef uh, just after the, uh, the Second World War. Uh, and I think it's important to, for all of us to remember that in the Second World War, uh, the United States was allied with China and uh, against the Japanese. And as a result of that war, hundreds of Americans learned how to read and write Chinese. Um, and when the, after the war ended, uh, many of them became scholars and several of them uh, and their later students were very important in establishing the discipline of Chinese art history at several universities in the United States. Uh, I mentioned that not only to, to inject a little bit of history, um, but also to stress the fact that exhibitions organized by, by art museums uh, have often been very important uh, stimulants for, for scholarship and research. Uh, the bringing together of actual works of art where not only scholars, but the public can come and see and enjoy them has, still plays a very important role in America for our understanding of China and indeed for the rest of the world. So I'd like to begin this survey with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Uh, this is the facade, uh, the front entrance of the Metropolitan Museum in New York uh, on Fifth Avenue, uh, known in Chinese as the Da Du Hui Bo Guan. It opened to the public in 1872. And this is a photograph uh, taken from a book of some of the Chinese art that was on display in the late, 19th and early 20th centuries at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And you'll see from this photograph, uh, which shows a very large gallery in the original building of the Metropolitan Museum, uh, this photograph here, and also this photograph, uh, all historical vintage photographs from, I think, well before 1920, uh, probably taken around between 1910 and 1920 that uh, most of what we see on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art about 100 years ago or a little more were Chinese ceramics. And 
I am focusing on this because Chinese ceramics uh, were among the first type of Chinese art to be collected by American art museums. Uh, ceramics are a commodity, a, a type of, of utilitarian ware, uh, be it plates or cups or bowls or dishes that everyone uses uh, around the world. And it was very fashionable uh, in the United States between about 1890 and 1920 to collect Chinese porcelain, especially from the Ming and Qing dynasties, which is mostly what we see uh, in these historic photographs from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in fact, uh, it's worth noting that to own an example of Chinese porcelain in that period, at the turn of the last century up into the 1920s and 30s, was a great status symbol in American society, especially on the East Coast, especially in New York, Boston. Um, Boston had, as we'll see shortly, a very old history with China, with the trade in tea and in silk going back to the 18th century. Um, if you know the story of the Boston Tea Party, which was uh, a revolt against English taxation of tea coming into America from China uh, during the time when the, the um, America uh, was a colony of England, uh, before the existence of the United States of America, uh, that tea came from China. And that, that so-called tea party uh, in which tea was thrown overboard from an English ship in Boston Harbor uh, was one of the beginnings of the American Revolution against the English King George III. This is a beautiful example um, from uh, formerly in the Metropolitan Museum of Art collection of a Kangxi era uh, porcelain made at Jing uh, This has a six character mark of the Kangxi emperor on the base. Uh, and it's a good example of the kind of porcelain from China that uh, particularly newly wealthy collectors uh, in places like New York, like Philadelphia, like Boston, were very attracted to because of their beauty, their technical skill. And such famous Americans as uh, John D. Rockefeller, uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Benjamin Altman, uh, Henry Clay Frick, who founded the Frick Museum in New York City, uh, all competed with each other at auction and with art dealers in London and Paris and New York to buy uh, works like this from China, from the early Qing dynasty. They were, they were clearly regarded as works of very high quality and great beauty. And uh, they, for the American public that first started going to art museums uh, between 100 and 120 years ago to see Chinese art, this is the kind of thing they saw most often. This is a beautiful tall vase, also from the Kangxi period, decorated in overglaze enamels. Um, during the Kangxi period, uh, literally millions of examples of these kinds of porcelains were exported to Europe initially, and then from Europe uh, to America. Um, we know, for example, that George Washington, the first president of the United States, ate his meals on porcelain made from China, probably not quite as fancy as this. I think the porcelain he ate off was made in the in the Qianlong reign of the Middle Qing Dynasty because George Washington was a contemporary of the Qianlong Emperor. But uh, by the early 20th century, uh, it was porcelain of the Kangxi period, which was not only uh, very much sought after by American collectors, but also, as I mentioned, uh, a very important status symbol uh, that you had, you had, you were somewhat important. You had taste um, and knew something of the world beyond the United States. As uh, time went on, and, and the Metropolitan Museum was one of the earliest big encyclopedic museums to be created and founded in the United States in the 19th century. Um, the museum started collecting Chinese art very seriously uh, beyond the realm of just ceramics and porcelain. Uh, this is a very important set of late Shang or early Western Zhou ritual bronze vessels from the 11th century BC or BCE uh, made of bronze. This was a set that was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1924, which would have been during the Republic period in China. 
Um, and this set is historically famous because it had also been owned by the late Qing dynasty official Duan Fam, who had a large collection of bronzes and other antiquities. It was in the early 20th century also that the Metropolitan Museum of Art began to collect Chinese paintings. Uh, initially, um, uh, rather haphazardly, uh, there, were, there, was really, there were really no experts on Chinese painting in those days. Uh, I would say in the period between 1915 and 1947, um, a large group of Chinese paintings were acquired from art dealers, mostly in Shanghai. Uh, and there was a flourishing trade in, in Shanghai and Beijing. There were many art dealers in those days in the early 20th century selling works of Chinese art, not only to Chinese collectors, but also to European collectors, to Japanese collectors, uh, and as we'll see, to American collectors. Uh, many of this first group of Chinese paintings that entered the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, were not authentic. Um, many of them were forgeries or, or copied. And it was, um, as I said, it was a period when there were not that many experts on Chinese painting. Um, so this is a good example of one of the paintings that was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1947. This came from a uh, the collection of American of an American missionary who had lived in China for many years, and, and uh, this painting today is not considered. It's it's signed by the great Ming Dynasty painter Tang Yin, but it is now attributed to him, and there is a lot of disagreement about whether it is actually by Tang Yin or a a Ming Dynasty copy. Um, and this is a this is always a problem in Chinese painting because the history of copying old paintings uh, is itself a very ancient history, and so it was not really until the decades after World War II when there developed enough expertise among American scholars and curators and collectors, and within museums in particular, to be able to determine whether a painting like this was actually by the Ming Dynasty painter Tang Yin or a very close copy. Um, as you know, uh, with Chinese culture, uh, copies of works of art can themselves be very old. It's not unusual if Tang Yin painted in the late 15th or early 16th century in the middle Ming Dynasty, that by the late 16th and early 17th centuries, there were already very many copies of Tang Yin's work. And today, when we see these copies, they are already four or 500 years old, and they are not genuine by Tang Yin. So there are many genuine paintings by artists like this, by, like Tang Yin in American collections. Um, and there are also many copies, but nowadays, generally speaking, museum curators um, have enough knowledge and expertise to tell the difference. Um, it was not until the Metropolitan Museum of Art hired this uh, gentleman, uh, Fang Wen, or known by his English name Wen Fang, as curator of Asian art uh, in the late 1960s. Um, Fang Wen was also a professor at university, at uh, Princeton University. Uh, he was an expert on Chinese painting, and with his expertise at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the museum really began to acquire very seriously early Chinese paintings from the Song and the Yuan as well as the Ming and the Qing dynasties. Um, the museum in New York was fortunate that in 1949, this uh, well-known painter and collector Wang Jiqian, or C.C. Wang as he is known in the West, uh, moved from uh, Suzhou to New York. And he brought with him a large collection of paintings, many of which over succeeding years, starting really in the early 1970s, he sold to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He lived only several blocks away from the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, he was not only a, a wonderful painter, uh, but also a great connoisseur. And had uh, he developed really an enormous collection of traditional Chinese paintings. And I would say the the most important group of Chinese paintings in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York today came from, from his collection, from uh, Wang Jiqian's collection. So I would just like to show you a few examples. Um, this is a small painting by the Southern Song Dynasty painter Ma Yuan, which uh, 
uh, came to the museum at that time. This one actually came from, I believe, a different collector, John Crawford, uh, who acquired things himself from C.C. Wong. Uh, but this painting here by Ni Zhang, one of the most famous Chinese painters, not only of the Yuan Dynasty, and he lived into the early Ming Dynasty, but also, without question, one of the most famous painters in all of Chinese history. Um, this is one of the very few paintings by Ni Zhang in an American art museum collection. They have owned this since, I believe, 1972. Um, the Metropolitan Museum, interestingly, had bought several fake Ni Zans earlier before the Second World War, uh, which they still own. Uh, you can look those up on the Metropolitan Museum's website. Uh, and when you compare it to a painting like this, uh, which is one of Ni Zan's great works, uh, a very late work painted only two years before he died, um, you can see the difference, uh, particularly when you see the painting in the flesh. Uh, it has a beautiful inscription in Nizan's calligraphy at the upper right, and at the top is a short inscription by the Qianlong Emperor, who himself was once an owner of this work. Um, the Metropolitan Museum also has a great collection of Ming Dynasty paintings, as well as Qing, and they now are, uh, they've developed also a, uh, significantly a very good collection of early and mid 20th century paintings from China, and are also now very seriously collecting contemporary Chinese paintings as well. Um, this is a painting which the Metropolitan Museum bought from Wang Ji Chen. <coughs> um, actually, it was a gift to the Metropolitan Museum, a painting that had originally been in Wang Ji Chen's collection. This is a Ming Dynasty painter named Liu Jun, who was a painter in the court uh, in the Forbidden City in Beijing during the late 15th century. Uh, Liu Jun was a court painter at the court of the Hongzhi Emperor of the early Ming. And his work is quite rare. He was a well-known figure painter. And this is a beautiful example of his work, which is actually a depiction of a story from Chinese history uh, in which uh, an early six dynasties period emperor is shown seated on a throne in front of a screen in a garden. And one of his officials has just criticized him and this documents his response to that criticism, uh, how he went from being very angry to actually, in the end, rewarding the official for following his duty to critique the ruler. Uh, part of a Confucian official's traditional responsibility. I, I should just mention that painting was uh, almost certainly commissioned by a Ming emperor to hang in the Forbidden City. Uh, one of the really important exhibitions organized by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York uh, was this exhibition, uh, The Great Bronze Age of China, which was held in 1980 in New York. It then traveled to several different cities around the United States, uh, including San Francisco. I believe it was in Kansas City, Missouri. It also went to Toronto in, in, uh, in Canada. And this was an amazing exhibition because it, it included many works from mainland China that had been excavated during the Cultural Revolution between 1966 and 1976. Uh, people were very surprised uh, in the West and in the United States at just how much archeology span had been done during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, I'll just show you two slides from that exhibition. This is a, a very early Shang Dynasty Jue, a ritual vessel to pour wine, discovered at the site of early To in Henan. Uh, it's very early Shang from the 17th century BC, and this Hu vessel, uh, also from the Shang Dynasty. Both of these were in that exhibition. And I remember that the Metropolitan Museum in 1980 organized an international symposium, a conference at the Metropolitan in New York, uh, to which were invited all of the leading Chinese archeologists from mainland China who had actually been involved in excavating works like this. And also many of the historians and art historians and archeologists who are active in the United States and other countries outside of China uh, to assess the uh, the significance of these recent archaeological finds from China and also to reconcile the, the historical information that was included in the inscriptions cast into these bronze vessels when they were made with the historical traditions that had been, been passed down to us from such texts as the Shu Jing and so on. And it was a very important moment in 1980 of bringing together together 
uh, the top experts on the history of calligraphy, on the history of bronze casting, on, on history, on texture from China and from the United States. And I was very fortunate as a, a young scholar to be able to attend that conference. And it was uh, for, for knowledge of and um, research on Chinese art and culture and early Chinese history in the United States, this exhibition was a very important example of how exhibitions organized by museums could be a, a very important catalyst for research. I'd next like to turn to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, the Boschetun Ishu Boguan, which opened to the public in 1876. And Boston um, is, I would say unique among American art museums in that, in my opinion, they have the best collection of Chinese art uh, in, in America. Some people would say it's the best collection of Asian art under one roof anywhere in the world because it includes art from China, Korea, Japan, India, Southeast Asia, and the Himalayas, as do many other museums. But Boston had the distinction of beginning to collect very early. I would say, in a serious way earlier than any other major art museum in the United States. In the late 19th century, uh, around the turn of the last century, um, Boston hired this man, Ernest Fenelosa, an American scholar who had trained at Harvard, who had met, lived for many years in Japan and had actually taught art history in Japan during the Meiji period to be its first curator of Asian art. And Fenelosa, who was a brilliant scholar, uh, he did a lot to popularize Asian art um, in the United States. He was, I would say, more an expert on Japanese art than Chinese art. But he, uh, he collected, uh, he formed a great collection of Japanese art, including Buddhist art and painting. But he also acquired many Chinese paintings in Japan, paintings that had actually come to Japan during the Song and the Yuan dynasties. And these paintings, I'll show you images of some of them, are today, I think, some of the most rare and important Chinese paintings in any American collection. Uh, when he was curator of Asian art at the, uh, at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Fenelosa was uh, benefited from the patronage of several important collectors, among whom were Edward Sylvester Morse. These were, um, these were very smart, well-educated Bostonians, um, many of whom had gone to Harvard University, um, many of them who had traveled uh, in Asia, certainly as far as Japan, if not uh, to elsewhere. And with their money, they were able to, to buy Fenelosa's collection and began expanding on what he had collected. Uh, Fenelosa, when he lived in Japan, met this scholar named uh, Okakura Kakuzo, who was a fascinating Japanese art historian who had very deep knowledge of Chinese art. Uh, Kakuzo was hired to be one of the curators in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Unfortunately, he died quite young in 1913, but up until that point, um, he was one of the primary scholars in the museum in Boston. Uh, he traveled frequently, uh, not only throughout his native Japan, but also to China. Uh, this is a wonderful photograph of Okakura Kakuzo, who is seated at the right, um, visiting and spending time living in the Taoist temple in Beijing called the Bayun Guan, the White Cloud Monastery. Uh, this was taken in 1906 during the Guangxu reign of the late Qing dynasty. Uh, Kakuzo, of course, could read and speak Chinese uh, perfectly well. And he took advantage of his travels in China to acquire certain works of Chinese art for the museum in Boston. Uh, a very unusual story, but Kakuzo was a great scholar. He also traveled to India uh, while he was curator uh, at Boston and added some of the earliest works of art from India to enter uh, the Museum uh, of Fine Arts collection in Boston. Um, some of the paintings that came uh, because of the activities of Kakuzo, both in Japan and in China, um, even though some of them came into the museum shortly after he died, include this very beautiful fan painting by Ma Yuan, uh, the second example of Ma Yuan's work that I'm showing. Uh, 
Uh, this is a particularly interesting work because it bears three seals of probably the most uh, important collector of the Ming Dynasty uh, named Xiang Yan Bian. You can see uh, his seals at the right, the three seals. Uh, so we know that this Ma Yuan painting from the Southern Song Dynasty was already a very deeply appreciated and loved painting from the Song Dynasty in the, in the late Ming Dynasty. Uh, these are several from a group of paintings of Loha uh, by two Southern Song painters uh, who worked at a, uh, a painting studio in, in Ningbo, in Zhejiang province, in the Southern Song dynasty in the 12th century. Uh, this was part of a set that was acquired by um, a temple in Japan. Uh, in the, these paintings, uh, which were originally a set of 100 works uh, depicting Lohans or Arhats, the, among the original disciples of the Buddha in India. This was a big set of Lohan paintings that was in Japan, certainly uh, by the end of the Southern Song Dynasty or the early Yuan Dynasty. By the 14th century, these paintings were already in Japan. They were purchased from a studio, um, a painting studio in Ningbo by Japanese Buddhist monks who brought them to Japan. And most of them are still owned by the, um, the great Chan or Zen temple in Kyoto called Dai Tokuji. Um, they have owned these paintings for hundreds of years. And they are very beautiful, very important because they are signed by the artists. They were done, the whole set was done by two different artists. Uh, several of them are dated. Uh, by ins in inscriptions in gold directly on the surface of the painting. Those have faded a bit, but they're still visible in infrared light. And Fenelosa was able to bring a large group of these Lohan paintings for a special exhibition in Boston in 1906. And uh, the temple in, in, that owned the paintings, the Dai Tokuchi Temple, actually needed money um, at that point. So they the abbot of Dai Tokuji in Kyoto agreed to sell a few of the paintings to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, I'm sure to some extent because they knew and trusted Fenelosa and they, they knew and trusted Okakura also, who was Japanese. Um, and so these two paintings are from a, that much bigger set, extremely rare. The rest of them are now, uh, although they are owned by the Dai Tokuji Temple in Kyoto, which is still an active Zen Buddhist temple, uh, mostly they are kept, uh, the bulk of the set are kept at the Nara National Museum in the city of Nara between Kyoto and Osaka. Uh, this is another painting that was acquired by Okakura. Uh, this one acquired in 1912 uh, in China. Um, and it depicts uh, the Buddhist monk Budai Hoshang with little boys. This is an early Ming court painting. Uh, it has a seal of the Ming Palace at the upper right. It's dated to the year 1503, uh, which I believe was toward the end of the Hongzhi Emperor's reign. And uh, a very beautiful example, again, of a court painting done for the Ming court. Um, quite a rare work, especially in that it has a date. There are many such works in Chinese collections in such museums as Beijing, the Palace Museum, um, the Shanghai Boguan owns many beautiful examples of Ming Dynasty court painting. Uh, they are more rare outside of China, uh, but this is a beautiful example. Uh, probably the most famous Chinese painting owned by the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston is this work by the Northern Song Emperor Hui Zong, uh, the five colored parakeet, uh, which <coughs> was purchased in 1933. And um, again, a very rare work. The bulk of Hui Zong, who was a, a, a very, probably a better painter than politician, uh, the bulk of his works are in museums in mainland China and in Taiwan. I think there's one example of his work in Japan, a small painting that was in Japan by the end of the 13th century. Uh, so there's been, there was a very strong trade in art between China and Japan in the Song and Yuan dynasties, and many of the Chinese paintings, uh, many of the best Chinese paintings in the Boston Museum were actually purchased in Japan and um, had been in Japan, as I said, since the Song or Yuan dynasties. Uh, 
The third museum I'd like to introduce is the Freer Gallery of Art, Philly Er Meishuguan in Washington, DC. Uh, this is an amazing collection. It's also one of the greatest collections of Chinese art in the United States. It has its own very unusual and impressive history. It was founded in 1923. And it was founded by this American collector, Charles Lang Freer, uh, who was an industrialist from Detroit, Michigan, uh, not far from Ann Arbor. Uh, he was a collector initially of American painting. And early in his adult life, Freer met the famous American painter, James McNeil Whistler, who lived mostly in London. And Whistler uh, was himself already um, a very important collector of Asian art, mostly Japanese art. Uh, this is a classic painting by James Whistler, uh, Caprice in Purple and Gold, the Golden Screen. It is owned by the Freer Gallery of Art uh, because Freer became a very good friend of the painter Whistler. Uh, Whistler convinced Freer to begin collecting Asian art and Freer started with blue and white porcelains from Japan, but very quickly discovered Chinese art. Um, Freer made many trips to Japan and made several trips to China before the end of the Qing dynasty, uh, to Beijing in particular. He would spend uh, several weeks in Beijing visiting art dealers uh, in Beijing. And this was still during the, the late Qing dynasty. And so it was a very, it's a very rare, unusual story uh, about an American collector. This is a photograph that shows Charles Freer in Cairo. He is the second figure from the left in this photograph uh, with a uh, visiting an art dealer in of Egyptian art and Middle Eastern art in Cairo. Uh, this is a photograph of Charles Freer in Japan about the time when he was starting to visit China. Um, I would say between 1906 and 1911. Uh, again, this was Japan in the Meiji period. And when he was in China, it was during the end of the Qing dynasty. Freer actually went to Boston and saw the exhibition uh, that had been organized by um, Fenelosa and Okakura of the Lohan paintings uh, from the Southern Song Dynasty. And he was able to buy, I think, two of them. So two of these paintings from the set I mentioned earlier are now in the Freer Gallery in Washington, DC. Uh, but Freer had a, a great love for Chinese art. And I would say not just paintings and ceramics, but jades, ancient bronzes. He was really a, um, a well-informed collector. He, he asked scholars for advice. He never, he never knew Chinese language, um, but he worked with the best art dealers, the most knowledgeable scholars, and he built a very strong collection. And one of the most important paintings in the collection today in Washington, DC, is this work attributed to the Northern Song painter Mi Fu, uh, a painting called uh, Yun Chi Lo, The Pavilion of Rising Clouds. And I just wanted to show this painting because I believe he acquired this in Japan, um, but this is a significant work uh, for a number of reasons, uh, in part because the title written above the painting is written by the late Ming artist Dong Chi Chang, who knew this painting very well. Uh, there's a short inscription on the painting itself at the upper right, attributed to Emperor Huizong. And uh, there are inscriptions by Qing Dynasty collectors on the margins of the mounting. Uh, this is a very old painting, whether it's by Mifu or not, it is almost impossible to know. There are probably no authentic works which are agreed by scholars to be actually by Mifu. He is known mostly from copies from the Song Dynasty onward. So that's why this work is attributed to Mifu, but it's a beautiful Northern Song painting uh, or perhaps early Southern Song on silk, just ink, no color. Uh, it's been, it has a lot of old damage, but it has been very beautifully repaired and is one of the great treasures of the Freer Gallery of Art. Uh, just a few other paintings from the Freer collection. Uh, this is a painting, a detail of a long hand scroll attributed to Gu Kaijiu, uh, one of the most famous uh, early Chinese paintings, painters uh, in Chinese history. One of the first we know who's his name. 
Gu Kaijie lived during the Eastern Jin Dynasty, the Dong Jin. He was a contemporary of Wang Shijie, the great calligrapher. Um, we again, it's not known if any, it's not certain if any original paintings by Gu Kaijie survive. Uh, this is widely believed to be a copy of a Gu Kaijie composition depicting the story of the the nymph of the Luo River, uh, the Luo Shan, uh, a very famous theme from Chinese literature from the Sixth Dynasties period. And this is a detail of that scroll, which exists in several different versions. Uh, there's another beautiful version of this scroll now in the Liaoning Provincial Museum in Shenyang. And this was acquired uh, in 1914. Uh, Charles Freer as a collector was mainly interested in buying Sung and Yuan paintings, but because he himself was not a scholar, I mean, he was a collector, he was a very wealthy man, but um, it, in the end, although he did acquire many Sung and Yuan paintings, he also bought many paintings which he believed were from the Sung and Yuan dynasties, but were actually Ming dynasty copies. So this is a good example. This is a painting which he bought as a work by Ma Yuan. Uh, we know now that it is not a Southern Sung painting by Ma Yuan, but it's actually an anonymous landscape in the style of Ma Yuan from the Ming Dynasty. It is uh, part of the school of Ming Dynasty painting called the Zhe School or the Zhe Pai, um, many of whose artists work in the court and in the Hangzhou area of Zhejiang. This is from the 16th century. Again, even though it's not by Ma Yuan, it is still 1,400 years old on silk, a very beautiful painting. Uh, and a very good example of the continuation of Ma Yuan's style into the Ming Dynasty. Okay, now I would like to turn to the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, I apologize that I was not able to put all the Chinese characters of the museum's names in this place, but this is known in Chinese as the Kalifulan Ishu Boguan. It's in Cleveland, Ohio. It opened to the public in 1916. And Cleveland was unusual in that it had a curator of Asian art who had some training in Asian art and culture quite early. This gentleman, Howard Hollis, served as curator of Asian art at the Cleveland Museum from 1929 to 1949. And he started acquiring Chinese art very seriously. Um, not so much paintings, but um, other kinds of objects, ceramics, um, <coughs> pardon me, jades, bronzes, lacquers, uh, this kind of thing. He did acquire one or two Chinese paintings that were important. Uh, he bought, for example, a hand scroll, I don't have a picture of it, <coughs> by the son of Mifu, Mi Yoren, a uh, late Southern Sung painter, which had, which Hollis bought in Japan. And that painting had been brought to Japan by the uh, very famous late Qing Dynasty scholar, uh, Luo Zhenyu who was uh, famous um, not only as a, as a scholar of early Chinese calligraphy, uh, Luo Zhenyu was one of the early experts on Jia Guwen, or Oracle Bone Script of the Shang Dynasty. Uh, but Luo Zhenyu, uh, because he was loyal to the Qing Dynasty after the Qing Dynasty ended, when the Qing Dynasty fell and the Republic was established um, in 1911, 1912, Luo Zhenyu was loyal to the Qing and wanted to re-establish Pu Yi onto the throne in the Forbidden City. And because he was politically against the Republic and against uh, Sun Yat-sen, Sun Zhongshan, Luo Zhenyu had to flee to Japan. And he lived in Japan in Kyoto for about six years between roughly 1912 and 1918. And he survived, Luo Zhenyu survived in Japan by becoming a dealer an art dealer. He sold many Chinese paintings, which he brought with him uh, to Kyoto. Uh, he was the teacher of many of the Japanese connoisseurs of Chinese painting in the Taisho period, in, the in, uh, in that period, actually in the late Meiji um, period. And then uh, it was really not until, oh, by the way, this is a wonderful photograph of the Chinese art gallery at the Cleveland Museum of Art in Ohio in 1916. And I think you can see here uh, that paintings are not the dominant type of art. Um, there are some beautiful ceramics, beautiful examples of uh, bronze, uh, some Buddhist sculptures of stone, um, 
a Qing Dynasty lacquer screen on the back wall, uh, but only a few paintings. And at this time, those paintings were probably forgeries, even though they may have been quite old. It was not until the arrival at the Cleveland Museum of this man, Sherman Lee, uh, in the 1950s, that Cleveland really began to create a serious collection of Chinese art that was systematic, that was comprehensive. Uh, Sherman Lee had a very interesting history. He had, just before the beginning of the Second World War, uh, he had obtained a PhD in the field of American painting. And Sherman Lee entered the United States Navy during the Second World War. He ended up in Japan after the fall of Japan in 1945, and he served as an official uh, under Douglas, General Douglas MacArthur uh, in, during the American occupation of Japan in the late 1940s. Uh, and Sherman Lee was appointed to make an inventory of all cultural treasures in Japan, whether they were in museums or private collections or Buddhist temples. So Sherman Lee uh, got to became, through that experience, Sherman Lee became an expert uh, on Japanese art and Chinese art. Uh, after he left the Navy, he became a curator and then director of the Seattle Art Museum. And then in the mid 1950s arrived at the Cleveland Museum of Art. And although he never knew any Asian language, Sherman Lee never knew Chinese or Japanese, let alone Sanskrit or Tibetan uh, or Korean, he had, I would say, probably the most gifted eye and taste of any museum director in the United States in the 20th century. Uh, he was not only a great connoisseur of Asian art and especially Chinese and Japanese art, but also of European art, of ancient Greek and Roman art, of European old master paintings. Um, I was very lucky in the brief period that I was a curator at the Cleveland Museum of Art to get to know him after he retired. Uh, and was able to travel with him on buying trips for Cleveland because Cleveland kept him on as a consultant. This is a photograph of Sherman Lee in the storeroom of Asian art in the basement of the Cleveland Museum of Art in the 1950s, uh, shortly after he had arrived. Cleveland, uh, the Cleveland Museum of Art is one of the wealthiest art museums in America because Cleveland was a very important industrial city uh, from the late 19th century all the way up until probably the 1960s and 70s. So Cleveland, um, even though it was founded many years after the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and after the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Cleveland uh, has always been a very rich museum and able to create fairly quickly under Sherman Lee's guidance, uh, a major collection of Chinese art. Uh, Sherman Lee also became very famous as a scholar. He wrote one of the most uh, widely used textbooks of Asian art, which included not only Chinese art, but Korean, Japanese, Indian, Himalayan, and Southeast Asian art. These are two different editions of this book, which was called uh, A History of Far Eastern Art uh, by Sherman Lee. Um, Sherman Lee also, interestingly, when China first began to open up to American scholars as early as 1976, Sherman Lee led the first group of American scholars of Chinese art on a study trip to China in 1976 that included um, professors from universities, it included curators. Uh, this is Sherman Lee here with the bow tie. He's probably the tallest person here with his camera. Uh, Included also in this photograph is James Cahill, the famous professor from the University of California, Berkeley, whom we will talk about more a little bit later. Uh, and many other famous scholars from American universities. Here is Lawrence Sickman from the Nelson Atkins Gallery in Kansas City, Missouri. And they spent about a month in China visiting museums, visiting archeological sites. Um, this was the, really the first group of American scholars to see the remarkable uh, archaeological excavations that had happened in China during the Cultural Revolution. It was a very eye-opening trip and had a big influence on subsequent research in Chinese art history in the United States. Um, Sherman Lee was very clever to hire as a curator of Chinese art at the Cleveland Museum of Art, this Chinese scholar, uh, He Hui Jian, or known by his Cantonese name, Wai Kam Ho. Uh, this is a photograph of Wai Kam Ho in around 1989 when he was the curator at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, 
And Wai Kam Ho was a brilliant scholar who knew Chinese, knew, it was his native language. He knew classical Chinese. He knew Japanese. He was uh, an amazing scholar of Chinese painting, of Chinese calligraphy, of Buddhist art. He was like a walking encyclopedia of Chinese art and culture. He passed away in 2005. I was very fortunate to meet him in um, the late 1970s uh, when I worked at my first job at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. And as a team, Sherman Lee, who we see on the left in this photograph, and uh, Huai Kam Ho or He Huai Jen in the middle, uh, were a formidable team with Wai Kam Ho's knowledge of Chinese culture and Chinese literature and Chinese poetry, the history of Chinese painting, the history of Chinese ceramics, uh, I mean, Chinese calligraphy, history of Buddhism throughout Asia, and Sherman Lee's incredible taste, his amazing eye for quality. Together, they built an amazing collection of Chinese art, especially Chinese painting. Here they are shown in a storeroom at the Cleveland Museum of Art with the very famous German professor of Chinese art history at Harvard University, Max Lehr, uh, who uh, was also one of the great uh, European scholars of, of Chinese art who, who immigrated to the United States after World War II. And here they are shown in 1981 in Cleveland. So very quickly, just a few of the paintings that were bought uh, Chinese paintings that were bought by Sherman Lee and Wai Kam Ho during Sherman Lee's tenure at the Cleveland Museum of Art, which lasted from roughly 1955 until 1983. Uh, an important pair of tiger and dragon paintings on silk from the Southern Song Dynasty, attributed to the great uh, Buddhist monk Mu Chi. This acquired from 1958 from a collection in Japan. And these, these are examples of Chinese paintings that had been in Japan since at least the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, another painting acquired in Japan, a Buddhist painting showing the Buddha, uh, Shakyamuni, Shijamuni, uh, descending from the mountain. Uh, this is actually dated 1244 in the inscription above. This is an anonymous painting. We don't know who the painter was, but we know who the Buddhist monk who inscribed it was. Uh, another Chinese painting acquired in Japan that had been in Japan probably since the Muromachi period, since the 15th century, a painting by the great Chinese Ming Dynasty painter Dai Jin uh, of the Hermit Shuyo. This is a story from the Zhuangzi, uh, a Ming Dynasty painting. And Sherman Lee and Wai Kam Ho together created many important exhibition catalogs, which are still very important today. They did the first exhibition in America of the art of the Yuan Dynasty, the period, uh, the roughly 100 years during which the Mongols controlled China. Uh, starting with Kublai Khan in the late 13th century. Uh, this is the title page of this catalog. I just wanted to show you a few pages from this catalog to give you a sense of how serious the scholarship was that was happening in the United States regarding Chinese art uh, in museums and in universities. Uh, this was an exhibition of hundreds of works of art from the Yuan Dynasty. These are three paintings uh, by the Yuan Dynasty painter uh, Sheng Mo. Uh, they are from the Nelson Atkins Museum, from a Swedish collection and the Cleveland Museum of Art. This exhibition also included Buddhist art from the Yuan Dynasty, uh, calligraphy from the Yuan Dynasty, which in those days was fairly new for an American museum to exhibit Chinese calligraphy, uh, Chinese ceramics from the Yuan Dynasty as we see here, and Chinese lacquers from the Yuan Dynasty. This was an incredible show. It happened when I was in high school. I never saw this exhibition, but I'm just showing you to give you a sense of the new level of, of interest and curiosity about Chinese art history in the United States uh, that really started in the 1950s and 1960s and blossomed uh, subsequently. We'll now turn to the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art founded in 1933. This is the facade of the museum as it appears today. Uh, even though this museum opened fairly late, uh, you know, years after the museums in Boston and New York and Cleveland, um, the Nelson Atkins Museum was very smart to hire uh, a young scholar named Lawrence Sickman, who had been in the Second World War. You see him in his military uniform here. Lawrence Sickman had lived in China before the Second World War in the 1930s as a young Harvard-trained scholar. He spoke 
very good Chinese. He lived in Beijing for many years. And he was hired shortly after the opening of the Nelson Atkins Museum by the museum, uh, which sent him money in China to begin buying Chinese art. And I want to show you a few of the works that were collected in the 1930s, uh, when there were many old collections that had uh, old family collections in China um, that had fallen on hard times. There were many works of art that, that were for sale, both to Chinese collectors and foreigners. There were Japanese collectors in China at that time, uh, European and American collectors. Um, but uh, very few museums had an agent living in China who spoke Chinese and who really understood Chinese culture. Uh, this is a, um, a beautiful jade bee disc uh, from the late Bronze Age, uh, a fantastic example of Cizhou, where Cizhou Yao from the Song Dynasty, uh, probably from the 12th century with a dragon. Um, this very important landscape painting from the Northern Song Dynasty attributed to Li Chang, one of the great early masters of landscape painting. We actually do not know who painted this, but it's certainly a Northern Song painting. Uh, this one acquired in 1947. And so Kansas City uh, is one of the few museums in the United States that has a very serious collection of Song and Yuan paintings, as well as Ming and Qing paintings. Uh, in 1980, Sherman Lee, Wai Kam Ho, and Lawrence Sickman, and the then curator and later director of the Nelson Atkins Museum, Mark Wilson, put together one of the greatest exhibitions of Chinese painting ever organized in the United States, uh, which was the combined collections of the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City and the Cleveland Museum of Art. This was eight dynasties of Chinese painting. Um, I was very lucky uh, to see this exhibition uh, when I was 26 years old in 1980, and it made a huge impression on me. It, it was like uh, an encyclopedia of, of Chinese painting, a, a great opportunity for scholars and the general public uh, to see works of this quality. And finally, the sixth major art museum for Chinese art is the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, known by its Chinese name, uh, the Yajo Ishu Boguan. Uh, in San Francisco, opened in 1966, based on the gift of the private collection of the American collector Avery Brundage, who was one of the greatest collectors of Asian art in the world in the 19, from the 1930s up until his death in the uh, mid-1970s. I never actually knew him. Um, he was a very controversial figure. Uh, but he did form an extraordinary collection, which includes, and I'll just show a few examples of the treasures of the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. This Shang, extremely rare Shang Dynasty ritual bronze vessel of a rhinoceros, which has a very famous inscription mentioning the king of the Shang Dynasty inside, cast inside the stomach. Um, this is also very interestingly good evidence that northern China was uh, sub semi tropical during the Shang Dynasty and that there were both rhinoceri and elephants in Northern China at that time. That of course, China has dried out and the, the climate gotten much colder since uh, that time over 3000 years ago. Uh, this is one of the paintings in the Asian Art Museum that was acquired by Brundage. This was um, a landscape originally attributed to uh, Fan Quan, the early, uh, the 10th century, painter later attributed by other scholars to the Yuan dynasty. Uh, it has no signature, so we don't know who painted it, but now believed to be a work of the Jin dynasty in Northern China in the 12th century uh, that was contemporaneous with the Southern Song dynasty and illustrating the very powerful influence of the Northern Song dynasty painter Guo Xi. Uh, Many American art museums also now collect uh, old examples of Chinese calligraphy. This is a great example of Cao Shu, or cursive script by the Ming dynasty calligrapher Chen Xianzhang. He is an early Ming calligrapher. It's signed at the lower left by his Hao uh, uh, Bai Sha. And this is a great example of, of wild cursive script, Kuang Cao Shu, uh, probably one of the best early Ming examples in an American collection. So uh, 
in the short time we have left, I would like to just run quickly and introduce you to, to a few other American art museums that have very strong collections of Chinese art, perhaps not quite as strong and comprehensive as the six that I just introduced, but nonetheless, these are really important collections. And um, many of these museums also, of course, have the benefit of being in cities that have very important universities that teach Chinese art and culture. So the, uh, the graduate students and undergraduates at these universities, for example, the University of Chicago, uh, have the benefit of studying the collections firsthand in the, um, the Art Institute of Chicago, which was founded in 1893. Uh, this is one of the great Shang Dynasty bronze vessels, uh, a Fang Lei in the Art Institute. Um, one of the very few early Chinese paintings, a hand scroll, uh, attributed to the, um, uh, the northern Song painter Li Gonglin, uh, but this is probably also a Jin dynasty painting from the 12th century, but it reproduces the famous uh, Wang Chuan Villa, the Wang Chuan um, estate of the Tang dynasty painter and poet uh, Wang Wei. Uh, the Honolulu Museum of Art, uh, formerly called the Honolulu Academy of Arts, is one of the um, great surprise collections of Chinese art. It's a museum founded in 1927 uh, by this American woman, Anna Rice Cook, uh, who was a descendant of missionaries to Hawaii who came to Hawaii in the 1840s. Uh, she was very wealthy because she married a banker who worked in Honolulu and her husband died when he was around 50. She lived until her late 80s. And she traveled frequently to Asia by ship uh, between 1900 and 1930. She died around 1934. She would go by ship to Shanghai, to Yokohama. Uh, this is one of the early landscapes, uh, the Hundred Geese uh, by Yen Tu, uh, probably a, a late 13th century painting, one of the great paintings in Honolulu. Uh, another great treasure in Hawaii is this work by Wen Zhengming, one of the great uh, Wu Pai or Wu school painters of the Middle Ming Dynasty. Uh, his portrait of seven juniper trees, which were on the grounds of a Taoist temple in Changshu in Jiangsu province, painted 1,000 years after the trees had been planted. Um, the Seattle Art Museum in Seattle, Washington State, founded in 1933, also uh, has a very strong collection of Chinese art. Uh, I think I have this one example of a B disc from the uh, the late Zhou Dynasty in made of jade. Um, I cannot skip, of course, the museum where I work, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art or LACMA, which um, was established in its current location in Los Angeles in 1965. Uh, just an assortment of the range of Chinese art that we own, including ancient jades, bronze vessels, porcelain, uh, a Han Dynasty ceramic tomb sculpture of a horse, uh, an early Ming Dynasty cinnabar lacquer, and a pair of armchairs from the Kangxi period of the early Qing Dynasty, and just a few of our Chinese paintings in Los Angeles, uh, a painting of a pomegranate at the upper left, uh, by an unknown artist. We don't know who painted this, uh, but this was also in the collection of the great Ming collector, Shang Yan Bian. Below a hand scroll by Shang Sheng Mo uh, from the late Ming. Shang Sheng Mo was um, the grandson, I believe, of Shang Yan Bian and also a good friend of Dong Chi Chang. At the right, a painting by Wen Zheng Ming. And at the top center, a, an album leaf by Shi Tao from the early Qing dynasty. We have been able to do a number of exhibitions at LACMA uh, over the past several years as we aim to be one of the leaders to promote Chinese art and culture in the United States. Um, and uh, so just quickly, uh, in 2014, we did an, this exhibition on the history of collecting Chinese paintings in Japan and how Japanese taste in Chinese paintings differs from Chinese taste. In 2016 and 17, we did a, a huge exhibition on 17th century Chinese painting. You see in the center here, a large landscape consisting of four scrolls by Gongxian, a uh, very famous early Qing painter in Nanjing. And on the back wall in the far distance, a set of 10 hanging scrolls of calligraphy by Dong Chi Chang. 
Um, and then three, two or three years ago, we exhibited this very uh, amazing hand scroll of 10 views of the Lingbi stone by the late Ming painter Wu Bin, who is also a very close friend uh, of Dong Chi Chang. This scroll um, uh, was borrowed from a private collection, uh, will soon be sold at Pali auction in Beijing next month. Uh, one of the most astonishing paintings of a stone, 10 views of one stone, of one Lingbi, sure. Uh, from 10 directions. And then I'd just like to end very quickly with um, to give credit to several very famous academics. Um, there are many more than uh, that I could speak to. Uh, I've just chosen uh, three uh, to focus on because these three uh, active from the 1950s up uh, until, uh, you know, after 2000, uh, had the benefit of working at universities that also had museums. So their students could, could uh, study actual works of Chinese art in the university museum. This is Professor Richard Edwards, who organized uh, with his students at the University of Michigan, two very famous uh, and important and um, influential exhibitions on Chinese painting. One of the early Qing artists, Dao Ji or Shi Tao. This was in 1967 and a, an amazing exhibition on the Ming Dynasty painter Wen Zhengming in 1976. This is the cover of the exhibition catalog. Uh, these exhibitions gave these professors students the chance to actually learn how to be curators, how to, how to work with actual examples and not just photographs, but actual paintings. This is Professor James Cahill who taught Chinese art history at the University of California, Berkeley for many decades. Uh, Cahill was a, an astonishing scholar, a, a brilliant scholar, one of the great writers. Um, it was Cahill's writings about Chinese painting that caused me to, and influenced me to, to begin studying Chinese art history when I was an undergraduate. Uh, Cahill and his students at Berkeley organized many exhibitions uh, in the 1970s and 80s and 90s and even later. Uh, this was a very important exhibition catalog organized by the University Art Museum at, at Berkeley, which now owns Cahill's collection. Um, he was unusual in being a professor who also had a great collection, uh, most of which ended up in the museum. This exhibition, Shadows of Mount Huang, was a study of the Anhui School of Painting in the late Ming and early Qing dynasties. On the cover is a painting by um, uh, the great uh, Anhui painter, <coughs> um, his name is escaping me, but it'll come, come to me. Uh, an amazing show included works by Hong Ran um, and many of the other great uh, uh, Anhui school painters who lived and worked in the Yellow Mountains, the, the Huangshan. And Professor Richard Barnhart, uh, who was my professor uh, in graduate school at Yale University. Um, Barnhart started out as an oil painter as my understanding, and served in the US Army in Taiwan in the 1950s. He became fluent in Chinese and he taught for many years at Yale University. And among the many exhibitions that he organized was this exhibition on the early Qing painter Bada Shanren, uh, Master of the Lotus Garden, uh, an amazing uh, large exhibition at the Yale University Art Gallery, which also traveled uh, around the country. And that is, that is my last slide. Uh, so thank you very much. I would be very happy to take questions. Oh, thank you, Dr. Little. What an amazing fist. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. So, uh, Sung Tao, would you like to be, would you okay. like to take over? Okay, yeah. Thanks, thank Dr. Little. Thanks. Uh, okay, yeah, I have some uh, few questions uh, from the audience. The first one is from uh, Patricia. Uh, is it often to see shapes of paintings other than rectangles? Uh, rectangles are probably the most common uh, because, uh, of course, there are several different formats. The hanging scroll, which is the scroll that hangs on the wall, whether it's on silk or on paper, uh, usually rectangular in shape. Uh, hand scrolls or shodren tend to be very long rectangular paintings that are rolled, unrolled, bit by bit as one looks at them. Uh, there are folding fan paintings, which are curved shapes. There are um, Sung and Yuan fan paintings that are round. Uh, 
Uh, Chinese also uh, painted very often folding screens uh, with multiple panels. Mm -hmm. And so there are other formats, but the rectangular format is probably the most common. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is from Qiang. Um, the question is, uh, first is, when will LACMA be open to the public? LACMA, um, LACMA will open to the public as soon as the uh, COVID-19 pandemic ends okay. in Los Angeles. We are in a new building campaign and we will soon begin building our new building, but we, throughout the construction period, we will always have two buildings open to the public. And as soon as all museums in Los Angeles, which are now closed because of COVID-19 are allowed uh, by the county and by the governor of California mm -hmm. to reopen, we will reopen. But okay. you know, the COVID-19 situation is still very serious. So we don't know exactly when. Okay, and also the question from Chang is, can we have your contact information for follow-up question later? Uh, yes, I'm happy uh, to share my email address and maybe um, Su Chan could share it with everyone. Okay, okay. Uh, this question is from I th uh, Maggie. Uh, she's asking, is it any book to introduce those Chinese art collections that you just introduced? Any book, yes. Yeah. Um, each of the museums that I have mentioned uh, has published catalogs of their collection. Also, the easiest way to see their Chinese collections, for example, at the museum in Boston or New York or Chicago or San Francisco or Los Angeles, almost all of the collections are online. If you go to the museum's okay. website and look for either art or collections you, and, and just type in China, all the Chinese art will come up and you can see and study the whole collections. Okay, thank you. And this question is from Xiao Tong. Um, I think it's similar. Uh, are there any exhibition uh, exhibit ex exhibition catalogs for the LACMA exhibit for of Chinese painting? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, for uh, for our permanent collection, unfortunately, our our collection of Chinese painting is very small. We have maybe one hundred, um, which for an American museum is not a lot. But we are, uh, we are now preparing a new catalog. It should be available in about two years um, as a book. But uh, you can see almost all of our Chinese paintings uh, through, our, through LACMA's website, um, which is uh, lacma.org. OK, I've got more questions. Uh, this one, I think, is from Albert. Uh, um, first, is, it's an excellent review, and then which museum in the world come to mind? I think the question is for you, Dr. Little. For, for what? Which museums in the world okay. actually come to your mind, I think? For, for Chinese art, I assume. I, okay. Um, well, the, the, the top, for me, the, the best museums are, are in China. Um, and I have been traveling in China since 1986. Um, when I was a graduate student. So the museums I visited then in mainland China, I would say the most important, the, uh, the Gugong Bo, Bo Yuan in Beijing, the Shanghai Bo, Bo Guan, the Liaoning Sheng Bo Guan, the Qian, Tianjin Ishu Bo Guan, the Nanjing mm -hmm. Bo Yuan, the Suzhou Bo, Bo Yuan. Um, but there are many other museums in, um, throughout China which are very important. The Palace Museum in Taipei is also very important. Um, and uh, outside of China, there are, I mean, there really is Chinese art almost <laughs> in many other countries. Uh, there, there are important Chinese works in the Tokyo National Museum, the Kyoto National okay. Museum, and so on. And also the British Museum in London, okay. the Musée okay. Guimet in Paris, uh, the Asian Guimet. Museum in Berlin, for example. Another question from uh, Da Rui. Uh, he, he's a, he, Remember, you, LACMA has a collection of Qisha Buddhist canon. Do you show this collection in the near future? Um, it's a it's a Buddhist work. I think so. He said yeah. he found uh, one in Boston Museum. Uh, we do not have a big collection of Chinese Buddhist art, and uh, but what we do have. Uh, you can see on our website and also uh, it will, it will, we will do a very big exhibition of Buddhist art from across Asia 
from India to China to Japan to Indonesia in 2022. And that will be a very good time to come to LACMA to see all of the masterpieces of Buddhist art, including China, in LACMA's collection. Mm -hmm. So two years from now. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, this question is from L. L. Um, can you please introduce a, a little bit about the collection of modern Chinese art? Yes. Um, modern Chinese art, in other words, Chinese art made after the Qing dynasty. So in the Republic period and in the People's Republic of China, um, until recently, it was very difficult to find on display in American museums. Um, but now there's more interest, uh, there's a lot of interest in contemporary Chinese art. Uh, LACMA, for example, has just been given a collection of, of 400 contemporary, uh, mostly Chinese ink paintings, which we will begin exhibiting uh, about a year from now. And we also have uh, quite a good collection of, of early and mid 20th century artists like uh, Qi Baishi, Huang Binhong, uh, Fu Baoshi, Zhang Dachen, uh, artists who sort of create the bridge from the Qing dynasty to the present. And um, I look for more of those kinds of paintings to be shown in American museums, but that's, um, it's only recently, I would say that those early and mid and 20th century paintings and, and contemporary paintings are being collected by museums, but that's, that's changing very fast. Okay, thank you. I think the time's all, almost up. This is the last question for Lakma. Uh, are Chinese art pieces in LACMA online now? Yes, yes. Okay. If you go to LACMA.org, LACMA.org, and click on collection and then type in China or Chinese, mm -hmm. you will see hundreds of works in our collection. Okay, that's great. In color. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure. So, Dr. Little, uh, we cannot thank you enough for the fabulous presentation. It is a great fist, and we are going to make it shareable with more people that uh, care and love Chinese art. Wonderful. And before we sending it out, we will send it to you for your review. After okay. you approved, we will spread it out. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so very much. And my pleasure. Oh, this is a really fabulous. And I also want to thank all the um, all the participants to this great uh, presentation. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Lito. Thank you. Dr. Lito. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good night. <laughs>